Hey everyone, welcome back to uh, Calculus 3, where we're going to talk about sequences and sums, and ah, I got you. This isn't Calculus 3, this is uh, CC348. Oh, you guys got April fooled so hard, let me say, wait. Oh, I guess I'm a little bit late for April fools, but you know, I can still do stuff in the spirit of that, right? It's, there's always time for lighthearted silly math based pranks if you ask me anyway so we're going to talk about sequences and sums and i know a lot of this will be review but we're going to present sequences and sums in a slightly new context given you know some of the discrete structures work that we've done so far and what we're going to do is talk about how to prove things uh, regarding sequences and sums so it's going to be a little bit easy for this video uh it's mostly just a refresher and then a little bit of integrating sequences and sums into proofs. So let's take a look at what that looks like. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a sequence uh, in terms of things like sets and functions and all that kind of stuff. So what we'll do is we'll let S and T be non-empty sets with T specifically being a subset of the integers. And we'll let F be a function that maps elements of T to S. We're going to def we're, but what we're going to do is we're going to label f applied to n as a sub n. So a sequence is an ordered collection of terms with the nth term being a sub n. And given that we're talking about a uh, ordered collection of terms, this means that we're going to use uh, ordered n tuple notation. So in this case, as an example, if our uh, input domain, if t happens to be equal to the natural numbers, then we could have a sequence a sub zero, a sub one, a sub two, and so on and so on and so on. And the way we can write this in a more compact form is the sequence containing all a sub n with n equals zero to infinity. So starting at a sub zero and going all the way up to infinity. So an example of this is we can take a look at uh, n from n equals zero to infinity. What this is going to say is, let's take the uh, let's take the sequence of all values of n starting at zero and going to infinity. So this would be equal to the sequence zero, one, two, three, four, and so on forever. What we can actually do is we can also put we can really put whatever values we want for this base value and for the top value. So for example, we could do n from uh, n equals 37 to uh, 40 would be the sequence 37, 38, 39, and 40. So this definitely doesn't have to be an infinite sequence, and it definitely doesn't have to start at zero. It can start at wherever we want, so long as it starts at some finite integer. So you can't you don't really want to start something at like say negative infinity and then go up to infinity that 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 gets kind of gross and don't get me started with uh trying to start at infinity minus one you and i both know that's infinity we took calculus one at least i would hope you remember that from calculus one it's a very important lesson regardless uh we don't, we're not going to talk about infinity just yet that, that's that's for after the midterm uh another sequence that we can look at is two to the n from n equals zero to infinity. This would be the uh, the tuple, two to the zero, two to the first, two squared, two cubed, and so on. We could say that this is equal to one, two, four, eight, and so on and so forth. The last one I'm gonna show you is the sequence of ones from n equals zero to infinity. This one's a really tricky sequence, so I need you to, I, I, I want you to really pay attention right here. Um, all right, ready? The sequence of one from n equals zero to infinity is the sequence one, 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 and so on. God, I could keep writing ones forever. That's kind of addicting. But this is really all the sequences. And a way that I really like to think about sequences is 
since we're defining everything in here as the output of some function, so in this case, this would be like some f of n equals n. This would be f of n equals 2 to the nth power. This would be f of n equals 1. So we can think of a sequence as a way of sort of unrolling a bunch of values of a function. So rather than just taking a look at one specific value of a output of a function with from one specific input, we can say, we can say take a look at all of the outputs of the function from n equals 0 onward and upward. So if you think of a function as a little fruit roll up, then you could uh, you could unroll that fruit roll up and see everything contained in that fruit roll up sort of like how you would see uh, all the outputs of a function if you unroll it into a sequence. So that's 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 how I like to think of it. Is we're really just we're really just putting a function up on display, just kind of putting it all out there and letting everyone see what it's made of. You know. And the nice thing about a sequence is that sometimes it's really helpful to to see like how a fun function progresses over time with some of the inputs. Also, you have some you have some really cool sequences which. Uh, Unfortunately, I won't be able to talk about the Fibonacci sequence until we get into recursive sequences, but that, that's a whole other topic. We're not going to worry about that just quite, quite yet. All right, so now we can define the summation of a sequence. So we'll let a sub m, a sub m plus 1, all the way through a sub n minus 1 and a sub n. We'll let all of this be a sequence. Then the summation of that sequence is, uh, and you'll be familiar with this from calculus 3, hopefully, we'll do a large sigma a large uppercase sigma like this, and say that starting from i equals m and going to n, the uh, sum of a sub i is equal to a sub m plus a sub m plus 1 plus all the way through to a sub n minus 1 plus a sub n. So what we're doing is for every i starting at m and going to n, so i equals m, i equals m plus 1, i equals m plus 2, etc., etc., I equals n minus 2, i equals n minus 1, i equals n. We're just taking all of those a sub i terms and adding them together. So for example, we could say that the sum from i equals 0 to, let's say, some value n, some positive integer n uh, of 1, is, that's just going to be 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus all the way up through 1. And this will happen n times, so really it's just equal to n. Another example that we can actually prove right here is this theorem. So I'm going to say that the sum from i equals 1 to n of i, so this is going to be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, etc., that this is equal to n times n plus 1 over 2. And what we can actually do is, you know, summation notation because this ends up being a sum of n terms, we can actually do proof by induction really easily over all of this. So, you know, p of x or p of n here is going to be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way over plus n minus 1 plus n. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus everything in between here plus n minus 1 plus n equals n times n plus 1 divided by 2. That's all this is p of n here. And we're trying to show that uh, p of n is true for all n in the natural numbers, we could say. So I'll do this pretty quickly. Um, our proof, we're going to start with our basis step which is n equals 0. Uh, we'll note that uh, 0 times 0 plus 1 divided by 2 will equal 0, which happens to equal n. So the statement holds. For our inductive hypothesis, we should be able to just do a weak inductive hypothesis here. So for the inductive hypothesis, We'll say that suppose 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way up through k equals k times k plus 1 over 2. And we, then we just have to show it for uh, n equals k plus 1. 
So for the inductive step, we will consider what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at the summation by itself. So the sum from i equals 1 to k plus 1 of i, which equals 1 plus 2 plus all the way through to plus k plus k plus 1. And again, what we have here is all of this comes from the inductive hypothesis here. So we can just swap that out. So this equals k times k plus 1 over 2 plus k plus 1 by the inductive hypothesis. Then just doing some more algebra, this equals k times k plus 1 plus 2 times k plus 1 over 2. And then applying the distributive law, we have k plus 1 times k plus 2 over 2. And then I'll simplify this to make it look more like the theorem, that this equals k plus 1 times k plus 1 plus 1 all over 2. So therefore, by the, by the um, principle of mathematical induction, uh, this statement holds here. Now, I want you all to know that this is a sum that I want you to memorize. So if I ask you, hey, what is the sum of all numbers from 1 to n or from 0 to n? Uh, let's actually just make this a 0 because I realized the uh, inductive proof I used a basis step of 0 and uh, that this was 1. Um, really, you want those to line up. Um, you want those to match each other. Anyway, if I ask you the sum of all natural numbers from 0 to n, I want you to be able to give me this. So this is one of the few things that I'll actually like straight up, one of the three sums actually that I will straight up ask you to memorize for the midterms and finals and stuff like that. Here are the other two sums that I want you to memorize. So the first one is the sum of all, for uh, all i equals zero to n, the sum of all powers of two to the i is equal to two to the n plus one minus one. And we've actually seen the proof for this. This was the proof that said 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 1st plus 2 squared plus etc. plus 2 to the n equals 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1. So this is just exactly the same thing, but I've rephrased it in summation notation. So you should know this sum. And finally, this one, uh, the sum of all uh, 1 over 2 to the i from i equals 0 to n is less than 2. The reason why this is true, again, this you might re remember this from Calc 3, is that from i equals 0 to infinity, 1 over 2 to the i is exactly equal to 2. So because of this, if we stop our sum here at some finite n, then that sum is just going to be less than 2 because we're, we're still missing everything after n. So it, it just ends up being somewhere between 1 and 2 usually. So yeah, I want you to memorize these three sums right here. All right, so here is a graph theoretical application of summation notation. This is called the handshaking lemma. And the reason why it's called a lemma, my best guess is honestly because um, the handshaking lemma is used in the proof of a lot of graph theory related theorems. I can't say for, for certain, and there's a lot of debate on whether this should or shouldn't be called a lemma. And, you know, I'm not really going to go into that. I don't, really don't want to take sides on that right now. But um, we're going to let G equals VE be a graph. What I'm saying here is the sum for all vertices V in the set, in the vertex set. If we take the sum over all vertices in the vertex set of the each vertices degree in G, that this is equal to two times the number of edges in the graph. Now, the reason why this is uh, basically it's because um, it, it's basically because every edge contributes two to the total degree of the graph, one for each vertex that it has a connection to. But um, we can actually prove this really nicely using induction. So I'll show you all what that looks like. 
Okay, so in order to prove the uh, handshaking lemma using induction, which is uh, always kind of nice when we're using a summation notation here, what we're going to do is we're going to proceed by induction over the size of the vertex set. So how many how many vertices are in this graph? Our basis step is just going to be a graph with one vertex v. So since any edge connected to v must be a loop, then we know that the degree of uh, really that any loop adds two to the degree of a vertex. That's just by by definition of the degree of a vertex being how many edge connections there are on a vertex. So the degree of the vertex is going to be two times the number of loops connected to that vertex, or two times the size of the edge set. So therefore, the basically the theorem holds when we have a, a, a graph of one vertex. Our hypothesis is that the theorem holds for a, any graph on k vertices. And for our inductive step, we're going to show that it holds for any graph on k plus 1 vertices. So I'm going to create, basically, I'm going to choose some vertex v prime in v. And um, I'm going to choose some vertex v prime in v. <clears throat> and then I'm going to construct this graph, g prime equals uppercase v prime e prime. Basically, the only difference from G and G prime is that I just remove all V and all of these edges. Oh, sorry, V prime and all of V prime's edges from this graph here. So what we have is that our graph G prime has uh, K vertices. So by our inductive hypothesis, we know that the sum for all vertices V in our modified vertex set the degree in G prime of each of those vertices is equal to two times the size of our modified edge set here. Now, what I've done is I've defined E star to be the edge set of G minus the edge set of G prime. So what this is, is this is all of the, uh, these are all of the edges in E star, all of the edges that are connected to our special vertex V prime. So what this means is that the degree in G of V prime is going to be equal to the uh, number of edges in the E star, since E star contains all the edges that are connected to V prime. We'll further note that for all U in our, uh, sorry, this should be an uppercase V prime, such that U, uh, such that the, our, vertices u and lowercase v prime are connected, or that uh, this edge appears in E star, the set of all edges connect, uh, incident to v. This means that the degree in g of u is equal to the degree in g prime of u plus one, because we're adding another edge for, or we're adding another uh, degree to our vertex u for every edge that is uh, connected to u and v. So thus, this means that the sum of uh, over all vertices in V of their degree is equal to the sum of all vertices in V prime of the degree in G prime plus two times the degree in G of V prime here. That's my bad. Which is then two times the number of edges in E prime plus two times the number of edges in E star, which by construction of E star and E prime is equal to two times the number of edges in E. Uh, this proof I know is a lot, and you don't have to worry about this proof, but what you should memorize is the handshaking lemma itself, because this is really important. Hint, hint, you'll need it for a question on the midterm. Okay, so this has been Sequences and Sums. Thank you all so much for watching.